Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for our webinar, Supply Chain Visibility, a Guide to Transparency, Traceability, and Mapping. My name is Stacey Ajum, and I'm a marketing manager here at Siegel Scientific. Just to let you know, we are recording this webinar. All participants are on mute, but if you feel uncomfortable, you are welcome to log off at this time. All registrants will receive access to the webinar later on. Also, we'll have time for a Q&A at the end of our session, so go ahead and submit your questions throughout the webinar. If we don't get to your question during the Q&A, we'll follow up with you via email. And before we get started with our session today, we'd like to take a quick poll. So the first question is, my organization has complete end-to-end -end visibility over its supply chain. Do you strongly agree, agree, neither agree or disagree, disagree or strongly disagree with this statement? All right, and we're gonna close that on up and we're gonna move on to our next poll question, which is, a standardized labeling deployment is one way to integrate and store data into one place and enable supply chain visibility. Do you strongly agree, agree, neither agree or disagree, disagree or strongly disagree with this statement? Awesome, okay. So we're gonna close that poll up as well. And at the end of the session, we'll reveal the results. So just to let you all know as well, our presenters today are Elizabeth Sinclair and Stephen Pelletier. Elizabeth Sinclair is our Director of Marketing and Stephen Pelletier is our Marketing Manager. Off to you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Stacy, and hello, everyone. I'm glad you could join us today. You know that Siegel Scientific develops and markets bartender label software, also the largest collection of Windows printer drivers available, but that's not really how we think of what we do. Our true focus has always been understanding the problems businesses face today, anticipating their future needs, and then helping them solve those problems uh, with software tools. Recently, to help us better understand the issues of today's supply chain, we conducted research uh, that resulted in a comprehensive guide to supply chain labeling. Today's presentation is based on that guide, and we'll be sharing more about what we learned in future webinar sessions, presenting these webinars once a month or so. Future topics will include uh, things like seven benefits of an automated uh, labeling system, labeling and barcodes best practices, what is e-labeling and why is it important? And that's actually the, the one that I'm most excited about. And then the future of labeling, four trends to watch. So keep an eye out and register for these when, when you see that they're available. And if you'd like to have your own copy of this comprehensive labeling guide, look for a download link in the post-webinar email you'll receive from us. So we're proud to be associated with our customers, the people who use Bartender to keep the world moving and safely. The yardstick for our success is your success, our customer's success. And so with that in mind, let's talk about the supply chain. Today's session will start with a brief discussion of the supply chain and the impact a robust, well-implemented labeling program can have on visibility, traceability, transparency, and mapping. And then my colleague, Stephen Pelletier, who is the marketing team's technical genius and a talented bartender virtuoso, will show you ways that Bartender can help you deploy a top-notch labeling program. So let's go. We'll talk more about the differences between supply chain visibility, transparency, traceability, and mapping throughout this session. But at a high level, supply chain visibility can give organizations insight into how to work more efficiently, accurately, and improve workflows and processes. Visibility is imperative from two angles. 
First, it establishes interoperability with trading partners. And second, consumers have come to expect that they'll be able to access detailed information about the products they buy. But a recent survey by Geotis showed that only 6% of enterprise organizations surveyed felt they had complete supply chain visibility. And 77% said they had no visibility whatsoever or a limited view. But there's good news here. Visibility is achievable. And we've helped some of the world's largest companies create transparent supply chains with Bartender. The foundation of supply chain visibility is the data carrier, the label, the barcode, the RFID tag. You can't see or track an item in the supply chain if you can't identify it, if it's not marked. The label is crucial to visibility. Uh, labeling errors can disrupt the entire supply chain. You know, one error at an early node can cascade and multiply as a product travels from manufacturer to use. It creates havoc. It's really important to get this right. Supply chain visibility is knowing what and where a product is at any point in the supply chain. To really glean value here and achieve true visibility, trading partner systems have to be able to connect and integrate. We're talking about data from places like warehouse management systems, transportation management systems, database files, ERPs, spreadsheets, system clocks, scales. But we're also talking about regulatory information, status reports, and delivery details. And everyone has to be involved, all organizations and trading partners, manufacturers, vendors, warehouses, logistics, distribution centers, retailers. So that's a lot of disparate information to collect and view. Multiply those information sources by the number of trading partners in a supply chain system, and you start to get an idea of how complex things can be. Standardizing labeling is key here. If everyone isn't speaking the same language, if companies create their own different codes to identify products, dates, and locations, then supply chain interoperability and in turn transparency and traceability is virtually impossible. Yet companies have to speak the same language. And that's really where GS1 standards come in. They create a common language for stakeholders within the supply chain community to identify, capture, and share data. But for those of you who aren't familiar with GS1, it's the organization that develops and maintains global standards for business communication, uh, specifically barcode and RFID standards. For each industry use or application, GS1 establishes a standard symbology and its global underlying data taxonomy and syntax. So if you've ever wondered about the UPC code on your can of Coke, how it gets there and who agreed those numbers meant a 12 ounce can of Coke, that's GS1. But the UPC is just a small part of what GS1 does. The goal of GS1 standards is to provide global systems interoperability across industries. GS1 is a way for every business to speak the same language, if you will. You'll find GS1 standards at play in virtually every industry across the globe. Stephen's going to show you uh, GS1 serialized shipping container codes. That's SSCC because it's easier to say. Labels a bit uh, later. Today's supply chains really run on these labels, so I'm excited for you to see how Bartender can help you construct them. GS1 actually has a new standard called Digital Link, which is really poised to revolutionize the way data is shared across the supply chain. Digital Link uses web-enabled codes to share product information at any point in the supply chain to the consumer, retailer, medical professional in the case of healthcare applications, transporter, warehouse, or manufacturer. So Digital Link uh, URLs can be accessed through the scanner on a smartphone or in some cases on an app. The beauty here is that the data returned to the end user is contextual. It's a dynamic code that refers the user to different data depending on things like location, campaign, 
time zone, or demographics. The data delivered can change whether it's accessed by app or browser. So what does that mean? That means a consumer scanning a can of soup would likely see provenance, nutrition, ingredient, maybe allergen information, but they also might see a recipe or a coupon for a discounted price. A Japanese consumer scanning that same can of soup could see the recipe in metric system measures and the coupon in yen, while an American consumer could be delivered content in English measures in US dollars. So here's where, it, where this is important to supply chain management. A logistics provider or warehouse could scan that very same code and access handling information or hazard information. Oh, so a can of soup isn't terribly hazardous, but many CPGs like cleaning products have the potential to be. Things like rewards, provenance, care instructions, product registration can all be delivered through this one single code on the pack, depending on who accesses that information. And exciting and interesting, GS1 is talking about replacing that linear UPC barcode that we're used to seeing on all of our consumer packaged goods with a, this two-dimensional UPC code. So this one code will do everything. So much data can be delivered in one digital link code that products can carry different data even at the item level. That means every package, item, unit, every each can have its own code and be traced throughout its supply chain uh, journey. To me, the, the most exciting thing about this is when GS1 was developing the digital link standard, they came to us, they came to Bartender and asked us if we could help them uh, implement their proof of concept. And so we immediately added the GS1 standard into Bartender. It's available publicly. We're very proud that we of our role in helping here. So let's just think about the implications for tracking items through the supply chain. Item level ID, specific information delivered to trading partners and the way they want to receive it. This digital link is it's revolutionary. It's going to enable visibility, transparency, and traceability. So MIT's Sloan School of Management found that consumers are willing to pay between two to 10% more for a product when there is more supply chain transparency. So there is crossover between visibility and transparency, but the purpose of transparency is primarily fostering accountability and credibility by sharing information throughout the supply chain, often all the way to the consumer. Transparency results in quality standards being met, regulatory compliance, safety, timeliness, and accuracy, because data is available and visible to everyone. Supply chain transparency is created by a commitment between stakeholders to share information that's relevant and useful to their supply chain. Building transparency might require sharing with consumers, regulatory agencies, or prospects, depending on industry and application. But this is a way for companies to secure and maintain valuable partnerships and increase consumer confidence. Examples of data shared could include everything about a product as it moves from the manufacturer to its point of use, like ingredients a product contains, temperatures a product has been subjected to. In, in fact, many providers in food and pharma supply chains use RFID tags that transmit a green, yellow, or red value for each pallet. And that means a, a product remains green if it's been held at proper temperature throughout its whole supply chain journey, yellow if it's been out of temperature zone at any point, and red if cumulative exposure has compromised the product safety and it should be destroyed. So, you know, a refrigerator trailer can, of course, chill items during transport, but BTU capacity that's adequate for delivery to, say, Minnesota in March might be taxed by a route in Arizona in August. This compromises product integrity and consumer safety, so it's, this is important. Other data can include who handled the product, how long it's remained in transit from one point to another, manufacturing work conditions and labor practices. This is about ethical sourcing, which consumers really care about. No one wants an engagement ring featuring a blood diamond. 
Nobody wants sneakers made in a sweatshop. Also important to consumers are product and component origins. This is important for understanding the sustainability practices that have gone into manufacturing. The consumer trend towards desiring earth-friendly items manufactured sustainably has been really significant in Europe for quite some time, and it's trending upward here in the U.S. Many industries and regulatory agencies require consistent, reliable sharing of information and proper conduct. For example, in the food industry, there's the Food Safety Modernization Act that's referred to as FISMA, its initials. Instead of compliance by corrective action after a food safety violation, FISMA requires companies implement controls to prevent safety incidents, including traceability for information sharing. FDA has just launched a, a new initiative called the New Era of Smarter Food Safety, and this program is built on FISMA. FDA is working with international regulatory and standards organizations like GS1 to create a common, global, harmonized food traceability language based on harmonized data elements and standards. Medical device manufacturing has unique device identification or UDI, pharma has the Drug Supply Chain Security Act, and chemicals have the globally harmonized system, which provides a visual, non-language-based way to identify hazards and handling instructions throughout the supply chain. So what's at the meat of this? It's traceability. Supply chain traceability is the accurate, real-time tracking of parts, components, and products as they travel from the manufacturer to end user. Supply chains are increasingly global. That means they're more complex and traceability is much more challenging. You know, uh, getting back to the food industry for a minute, it's the most complex and largest global uh, supply chain by a long shot. It's a great place to look at the trends and challenges that all industries face. The food supply chain isn't binary or linear, one product to one location. The next stop for a single lot of Pollock fished out of the Gulf of Alaska could be a variety of locations all over the world. It may end up as an ingredient in surimi and in pet food and in frozen fish sticks and in canned products. This one lot might be processed in Asia, in Europe, and in North America. Current EU and US track and trace regulations require that any company that handles, produces, or processes food be able to track every ingredient back one node upstream in the food supply chain and every product that leaves their facility one node downstream. And in the case of a regulatory mock recall audit, or an actual recall, they're required to be able to produce those data within 24 hours. So this 24 hour time window provides a powerful incentive for the transition from manual to automated supply chain tracking processes. If the food supply chain were binary, uh, one ingredient into each product, each product advancing to the same upstream node, that 24-hour window would be fairly easy to achieve, but it's not binary, and that's a challenge. Interesting and maybe a little bit scary is much of the tracking that occurs in the food supply chain today is still manual, spreadsheets, index cards, even in 2021. Achieving the kind of traceability that regulations require without automation technology and without a supply chain that's automated and interoperable with back-end systems for all stakeholders integrated into all processes as much as possible, it seems impossible to do without, uh, without automation technology, this traceability. And just a side note, while we're talking about traceability, you're going to be hearing a lot more about digital twins and supply chain tracking in the press, and, and you may be hearing about it all, already. This new concept, which spans several technologies, IBM says it's a virtual representation of an object or system that is updated from real-time data. Digital twins can provide traceability not only throughout a product journey through the supply chain, 
but in some cases throughout its entire life cycle, which is really exciting. We'll talk more about digital twins in the supply chain in, in one of our future webinars, so stay tuned and register. Mapping. Mapping is where all of these data that we're collecting becomes actionable. It is the recording and then visualization of products movement throughout the supply chain. Mapping enables the analysis that increases operational efficiencies by showing every site, product, and supplier in the supply chain. Mapping may include information about manufacturing, origin sourcing, compliance, transportation and logistics, and critical business functions. So, what's in it for you? By performing traditional supply chain optimization, companies can often cut costs and take preventive actions. But without visibility, transparency, traceability, and mapping initiatives, they'll find it difficult to do things like promptly respond to disruptions in the supply chain. And this agility has been hugely important over the last 18 months. COVID has required companies to rethink their just-in-time manufacturing and, and offshore strategies. They'll find it difficult to do things like balance supply and demand, improve organizational workflows and processes, establish good working relationships with partners. If you, if you don't have visibility and traceability and you're not communicating with your partners, those working relationships suffer. It'll be difficult to manage suppliers. It'll be difficult to achieve customer satisfaction, enhance safety, make real-time adjustments, and ensure compliance across the entire supply chain. And again, the, the foundation of visibility, transparency, and traceability is built on the data carrier, the label, barcode, or RFID chip that connects product data to the item. There are lots of ways to design barcodes and labels and get them to your printer, but the right barcode and labeling software will scale with your business and enable things like compliance with evolving uh, international regulations, interoperability with trading partners for compliance across the supply chain, reduced redundancies, increased inventory visibility with smart labeling, seamless change management as the business grows. And then compliance with support important supply chain standards like GS1 or EPC Global's Gen 2 RFID standard. Uh, without the right labeling software, managing serialization can be impossible. Well, what is that right barcode and labeling software? Well, we of course think it's bartender, but so do the world's top supply chains. Every one of the 25 companies that the global research firm Gartner has named to their 2021 list of best supply chains is a bartender customer. And all of the 25 companies named to Gartner's 2021 top healthcare supply chains are too. In 2011, when Japan experienced an 8.9 magnitude earthquake, the manufacturing world was severely impacted. Japan was the sole global supplier of many goods, including 60% of critical auto parts. When the earthquake hit, these sources were suddenly in jeopardy. It shook global supply chains to their core. Organizations with high supply chain visibility were still impacted, but since they understood where their products came from and had mapped their journey throughout the supply chain, they were able to pivot to other sources. Having a backup plan and visibility before the earthquake meant that they had flexibility. Organizations with poor supply chain visibility were left scrambling and unable to establish alternatives when supply became unavailable. In some cases, production was completely shut down. So now we understand the value of supply chain transparency. We want to increase visibility. We want better accountability from and with our trading partners. Where do we start? How do we implement our plan? There are really four steps to this. The first is assess risk. Look where risks are in the supply chain, how likely they are to occur, 
and at what point um, they are going to occur, and then determine methods for detecting the disruptions they might cause. Uh, mapping is especially useful in this analysis. The second is get feedback. You need to keep the lines of communication open with trading partners to learn where they think information and service gaps exist. You have to manage compliance. Compliance is crucial for the regulated industries, right? But also for many of the non-regulated industries. Do you want to sell into Walmart or through Amazon? There are labeling rules that must be followed. Are ISO or GS1 standards important to your business? That's also compliance. Creating your plan for transparency means change management. You have to be immediately responsive to changes in regulation and standard and be able to assess where compliance risks may exist at any point in the supply chain. And then finally, implement improved automation technology. One of the simplest ways to create more transparency is through technology that digitizes elements of supply chain management, like labeling software. The right labeling software enables the integration of WMS and ERP into label and barcode creation and production. RFID tags and smart labels allow you to identify and track products in real time while ensuring that users have the information they need within the label, avoiding siloed, not shared data that can slow down the supply chain. So now that we understand the importance of visibility, transparency, traceability, and mapping in the supply chain, let's really talk about that right software. Some of you know my talented colleague, Stephen Pelletier. Stephen's going to take the wheel, or more accurately, the cursor here, and show us how Bartender enables supply chain visibility, transparency, and traceability. So Stephen, take it away. Thanks, Elizabeth. I'm sure a lot of that information kind of got people you know, worried about what they can and cannot see in their supply chain, right? Where is stuff coming to you? Where are you sending stuff to? And one of the primary building blocks to achieving and more importantly, maintaining a high level of visibility in the supply chain is the concept of the logistics unit. Logistics units can be all sorts of things, common things that you might already be familiar with, such as a case of an item or a tray of a particular item. Each one of those individually can be a logistics unit or even just whole pallets full of those cases and or trays can be its own logistics units. More uncommon maybe, uh, depending on your industry, I guess, would be you know like a barrel, a barrel of cleaning solution or maple syrup can be a logistics unit or a garment rack can be a logistics unit or even just individual single items that are much larger like a sofa or a treadmill can be a logistics unit. This concept of identifying something as a logistics unit is so important that GS1 assigns it the very first number in its application identifier numbering system 00, zero which identifies the serialized shipping container code which is a mouthful it's SSCC or as I like to call it the double O barcode because it gives you a license to bill a little supply chain humor the purpose of the SSCC is to tell the organization using it and as well as all of its shipping and business partners exactly what that logistics unit contains where it came from where it is now and where it's going in fact, in preparation for today's demo, I rummaged around in my recycling a little bit to see if I had any leftover shipping cartons, and there was the SSCC occupying significant real estate on most of the shipping labels on the outer cartons of things that I've had shipped to me personally. So let's take a deep dive into the double O barcode, how it's constructed, and how it's properly used so that you can harness the power of this traceability and visibility into your supply chain. We're going to take a look at the numbers first. This is the the SSCC barcode kind of in its primary form. It's not actually part of a, a label right now. We'll go into those in a little bit later. The AI, the application identifier, 00, zero right here, as we, as we mentioned, it's the very first one on the list. And this identifies that the following 18 digits is going to be an SSCC string, these 18 digits here. The next digit here is an extension digit. It might feel a little bit out of order as we go along, but it's important to remember that this is set aside to expand your ability to serialize this particular barcode. And we'll explain a little bit more on that in just a second. The following 
16 digits, these here, are going to be a combination of the company's GS1 company prefix and the serial number. It's flexible in that uh, several digits in the center can be either or, and that's going to be dictated by what your company prefix is. A uh, company prefix is assigned by GS1 to a company, and they tend to be between seven and 10 digits. But because they vary in length, this barcode affords you flexibility to use your GS1 company prefix and then the following digits as your serial number. So for example, if we have a seven digits here, right? So 0614141, -141. if this is your company prefix, you have the following digits to be your serial number. Likewise, if you had a 10 digit company prefix, you'd have six digits left over to use for serial numbers. Now, coming back to the extension digit, you can use this to expand your serial numbers. And normally it usually ends up being zero, but it's at the company's discretion to use this extension digit to make more unique serial numbers as you're labeling your logistics units. And the final digit here is your tech digit. It's your standard mod 10 check digit, and we'll go into that in a little bit detail in a bit. But what this does is it basically verifies that all of the information that precedes it is 100% correct, and it uses a, a mathematical formula to say, if it does not match that formula, if the digit here, if the check digit does not compute with that formula using the preceding digits, then the barcode is invalid. It's not right. And that's one of the reasons we're doing a deep dive in this so, so you guys can have a better, deeper understanding of what makes this label what it is so you can always get it right. With that check digit, how do we calculate that check digit? You can get your, your calculators out if you'd like, but Bartender does most of this for you. I'll just sort of explain it. What you'd want to do is you'd start on the right, not including the check digit, to this first digit here, and you would add all of the odd position numerals. So for example, you'd be nine, seven, five, three, one, four, four, six. And you add all of those up and then multiply that by three. Okay. After that, you take all the even digits, eight, six, four, two, one, 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 and add that to the previous sum. Then you find the rightmost digit in the ones position. If that final number is a zero, then the check digit is zero. If it's anything but zero, you take that number and subtract it from 10, and that is your check digit. Now, I know that that sounds like an awfully complicated process, and truth be told, it is. It's complicated because we want to make sure that this check digit is secure and that it is, in fact, verifying this information. The good news is the bartender does that for you. So we're actually going to go ahead and get rid of this right now, and we're going to build one of these things from scratch. We're just going to use a standard code 128 barcode because a GS1128 barcode is the same as any other code 128 barcode. It just has a specific data structure applied to it. And the good news is that Bartender can do that for you. So in the properties, you double click on the barcode, you can get into the barcode properties. Here in the symbology and size portion, we can use our GS1128 checkbox to assign it. Now see what happened there. The barcode changed. It provided uh, parentheses for what would be or should be the application identifier, and it got a little bit bigger. The bigger the barcode, the more data is in it. And what it's done here is it has included invisible control characters like the FNC1. It will include, uh, you know, record separators, group separator characters that are control characters that you can actually access manually here in the data sources under the uh, Omega symbol. And in our control characters tab, you can see these are what the control characters are. And you can insert these manually if you need to, but when you're using the uh, the wizard here and the, the checkbox, you don't have to do that. Bartender does all of that work for you, so you can focus on things that are more important, like getting things shipped out. Once you have this checked and you've seen that the, the changes have taken place, you can use the GS1 application identifier data source wizard, huge mouthful, and this process is going to walk you through the creation of this barcode. 
So the first thing we need to do is say, what application identifier do we need? We need that double O barcode. So we're going to select 00 and next. And for this process, we're going to use a separate data source for each component. It is possible to use one data source for all components when using the wizard. As you'll notice here, it shows you down here at the bottom what you're telling Bartender you are going to supply. So if you have this information, your, uh, your extension digit, your company prefix, and uh, logistics unit serial number already in a database as one value, you can use this method and just feed this in through your database. Um, Otherwise, it, you can use the separate data source for each component, and that helps us break down it for the purposes of this demo. So the first digit, of obviously, is the extension digit. We're going to leave that as embedded data, and we're just going to leave it as zero, and we're going to continue. The GS1 company prefix, again, assigned to a company by GS1, the organization, uh, is between 4 and 12. Technically, uh, usually between seven and 10, but just so you're aware, we're also gonna use embedded data for that. And we're just gonna add a few more numbers here. It's important to note that if you're in the United States, your prefix typically has to start with a zero, even if your prefix doesn't technically start with a zero. When you convert it to a GS1 company prefix, a global prefix, you put the zero in the front. So just remember that, it's a little uh, tip for you. We're just gonna add four, five, six here so that we have a seven digit company prefix. And then we're going to insert a serial number. We're not gonna use the database field, we're gonna use embedded data so we can make changes to it. But you do have options for other sorts of data sources. And let's just add, uh, we'll say 10523, oops. Now you'll notice down here, it added it to the right-hand side because this is where the, the one's position for your serial number is going to be. Anything unused is zeros. This is part of that flexible digit availability. So if your company prefix is longer, you have a little additional room. Uh, if it's shorter, you can have more serial numbers. But remember that that extension digit gives you the ability to expand that number. And we're gonna say, no, I don't need any more data sources, the check digit is automatically calculated. We're gonna finish that. And here's our GS1 shipping container code. So let's pull up a calculator and let's calculate that check digit, shall we? So what do we have? We have, we're gonna start on this one side, three, five, right? So three plus five plus one, Zero plus five plus three plus one, 18. And we're gonna multiply that by three. We have 54, okay? So we're just gonna take a note of 54. And then we're gonna take the even numbers, two, zero, zero, zero. So two, six, four, two. Two plus six plus four plus two is 14. And we're going to add 54 for 68. And if we notice here that the, this last number here, this one right here is not zero. So if it was zero, the check digit would be zero. But because it's not zero, we take this number, which is eight, and we subtract it from 10 and you get two, which is our check digit. So we know that we've done it correct. There is another way, there's an easier way to do this check digit. If you're not sure whether or not you've got the right thing, uh, if you're concerned about that, the GS1 website actually has a check digit calculator that you can use to double check your work. It's always better to double check regardless if you're unsure, but rest assured, bartender is gonna do this for you correctly every time. Okay, so now that we have this barcode, well, what are we gonna do with it? Bartender actually has a lot of labels that are included with the software that incorporate this barcode. So here is, uh, here's your SSCC down here at the bottom of this barcode, or this, uh, this label. Here it is on this label. Here it is again. And a slightly different landscape orientation label here. 
and your standard palette label. Remember this one, we're gonna talk about that here in a second. There it is again, and one more time. This thing is everywhere. I would encourage any of you to check your recycling like I did and see if this thing shows up on any of those shipping cartons that you might've received. Chances are it's gonna be there. So we're gonna go over here. We have our, uh, our palette label, right? The palette portrait label that we looked at just a second ago. It's a little bit of a mock-up. It's not to scale, but the reason for that is because we're gonna talk about placement. As my colleague Elizabeth had explained, it's not just the label printing that concerns us. It's making sure that all of the factors in your supply chain, all of the factors in your shipping, your labeling are working correctly. And one of those things is placement. Why is placement important? The whole idea of using a barcode in the first place is to increase the speed of data entry, right? It basically does exactly the same thing you or I could do with our own two hands. It just does it faster because you're encoding data with the intention of retrieving it later to populate another system by scanning it instead of manual entry. Manual entry is great, but you've got human error. You have mistakes. Things can get lost. Things can uh, things can go wrong. But with the machine reading of of a barcode, unless something went into the barcode incorrectly, again, bartender's doing most of that for you, especially in this case, when you read it out with a scanner, it's going to be correct. You don't have to worry about that human error and manual entry issue. Now, when you are scanning, that can be done either manually by a person using a handheld scanner or a mounted scanner on a piece of equipment, or it could be done automated with you know, a mounted scanner on some machinery, which is even more efficient. But both manual and automated scanning setups are best served by making sure that this label is placed in a location that will facilitate the reliable scanning of that barcode so that orientation and placement is very important. So then, right, where does it go? Let's come out here and I've got this blank label, which is going to represent our palette. This is a four foot wide by four foot deep palette that's four feet high. And it's not 100% to scale, but it's more for demonstration purposes. For this label, you would want to make sure that the orientation is tall and skinny so that the barcode is oriented in such a way that your barcode scanner can easily read it. If you're pan scanning, if you were to hold that scan gun out in front of you, uh, the, the laser is going to be uh, oriented horizontally, which is going to scan across these bars. That's the proper orientation. Likewise, with machine scanning, you're going to have that scanner set up in such a way that's oriented with a horizontal laser. Therefore, the bars of the barcode should be vertically oriented like we have here. The location of the label on your palette is going to be important as well so that it's going to facilitate either manual scanning or machine scanning as easily and efficiently as possible. So one of the things is the, the side of the palette, you don't wanna get it too close because as anybody's ever been in a warehouse, you can see that the corners of palettes oftentimes do get a little beat up. So you don't want it too close to the corner of the, of the palette. You wanna get it a couple of inches, a minimum of two inches away from the edge of the palette so that it doesn't get beat up. Uh, if you attended one of our previous webinars, the seven challenges in, in the supply chain, one of the biggest problems you can run into is damage to your label. So making sure that the label remains safe it means that it remains readable. And then uh, from top to bottom, the bottom of the label should be you know, somewhere between 16 and 30 inches. And that has to do with the height of the scanner, right? So you don't want people having to stand on their head to, to scan it manually. Likewise, uh, you know, machine scanning equipment typically isn't too close to the ground. So roughly in this range, you know, visibly is where you're going to want to place this label on your palette. One more thing to consider is that you do not want to put this label underneath any pallet wrapping. That is a crucial step. The reason for that is because if you wrap over it, it's possible that the scanner cannot read that barcode. And the worst case scenario, uh, contrary to popular belief, is not that the barcode could not be read at all. The worst case scenario is that if it were covered, it could be scanned and return incorrect or incomplete data. And as in our previous webinar, if you have incorrect or incomplete data, that data then gets sent to every other place that that data would normally go if it were correct, but now it's wrong and it's infected the whole supply chain. So the worst case scenario is that it does get read, but it gets read incorrectly. So don't put this underneath any kind of wrapping, put it on top and make sure that it's placed in the right spot so that you're scanning people or you're scanning machinery can, can access it efficiently and correctly.
that concludes the demonstration. I hope it was informative. I wanted to take a little bit of a more holistic approach to it. It's not just about label printing. There's a little bit more to it. Back to you, Stacy. Awesome. Thanks again, Elizabeth and Stephen. Um, before we start our Q&A, we're going to share the results of the poll. So the first poll was, my organization has complete end-to-end -end visibility over its supply chain. And we're split down the middle, neither um, agree or disagree or disagree. That was pretty interesting to see. Awesome. And then next, the second question in our poll, which was a standardized labeling deployment is one way to integrate and store data into one place and enable supply chain visibility. So we have some mixed results on this one. Uh, majority neither agree or disagree. Um, so yeah, pretty interesting. And Stacy, I'm hoping after this presentation, um, those numbers trend to strongly agree and agree. <laughs> I hope so too, I hope so too. Awesome. And now uh, we're gonna close out our polls and open it up to our Q&A. Um, if you haven't done so already, go ahead and submit your questions. And if we don't get to your question during the session, again, no worries. We'll follow up with you via email. Awesome. So the first question we have is, does the SSCC serial number require a specific serialization scheme? Oh, um, so that's a really good question. The answer is no technically. However, uh, GS1 definitely strongly recommends that a, a simple single incremental standard serialization scheme is used just to try and keep things as simple and as universal as possible. So while they are your serial numbers, right? These are your shipping container codes. If it's your company prefix in there, it's your serialization. You can do with it what you want, but it's probably best for everybody uh, and you know for longevity of the operation to just keep it as you know going from one to two to three to four as opposed to you know getting fancy with serialization that way if for whatever reason the person who comes up with the fancy serialization is no longer available that fancy serialization may not mean anything to the next person who takes over that job at the company or it might not even mean anything to you know the next partner who uh, you know gets that particular logistics unit. So standard one, two, three, four is, is what's recommended. Awesome. And so the next question we have is, how do I do supply chain mapping? I'll take that one. Um, so, uh, you know, one thing that we didn't talk about are, are the kinds of supply chain mapping um, that are available. Um, you can map for demand density, uh, sales territories, things like gross margin, um, distribution center uh, mapping, all of these help you get a different view of your supply chain. Um, if you use large ERP packages, uh, these capabilities are available within the software. Um, and that not only provides the mapping, but uh, in many cases also performs detailed analysis, which is, um, which is very useful. Um, there are commercially available uh, packages that can be integrated within your system. Um, and uh, for smaller organizations, there are also quite robust mapping programs available for free. Awesome. And so our last question uh, that we have time for is the GS1 application identifier data source wizard available? Um, is it available in all versions or editions of Bartender software? And um, how does Bartender make sure my labels are always uh, GS1 compliant? Yeah, I can take that. Um, so the, the application identifier data source wizard is available in all editions of Bartender. Uh, it's a really important tool and we wanna make sure everybody has access to it. And in terms of making sure that your data is compliant, uh, Bartender does a really good job of letting you know when something is not correct. Now, we we really can't take liberties with your data necessarily. So if you enter something incorrectly, we'll try to catch it. Uh, but if the if if it meets the formatting, but the data is incorrect, you know, Bartender is only going to be able to do so much. So it's really important to stay on top of your end of your data 
when you're entering it into Bartender. But if there's something wrong with the formatting, uh, the check digit is calculated for you. Uh, you know, we break down all of the components of each one of the application identifiers and data sources that are required to, you know, complete that string of data. It's pretty hard to to mess it up, um, but you know, you just you always want to make sure that you're you're keeping a really close eye on what it is that you're entering into Bartender, uh, because you know it's only going to be as good as the data that you put in. Awesome. All right. And so um, that's unfortunately all we have time for right now in terms of questions. But again, if we didn't get to your question, we're going to go ahead and follow up with you via email. Awesome. And um, on that note, Elizabeth, is there anything uh, that you wanted to add or mention? Yeah. Yeah, I'm mean, just to close. I think uh, really relevant and germane to our discussion today is an article that appeared in yesterday's New York Times. Um, it was titled "The World is Still Short of Everything. Get Used to It." And I just like to to read just a little bit of it. Uh, a shipping container that can't be unloaded in Los Angeles because too many dock workers are in quarantine is a container that can't be loaded with soybeans in Iowa, leaving buyers in Indonesia waiting and potentially triggering a shortage of animal feed in Southeast Asia. A pandemic related product shortages from computer chips to construction materials were, uh, were supposed to be resolved by now. Instead, the world has gained a lesson in the ripple effects of disruption. And so organizations with high supply chain visibility have the agility and are better equipped um, to pivot to other sources. There is no other time in the modern supply chain era that visibility has been so crucial to companies' success. And uh, with that, Thank you everyone for attending. I look forward to seeing you at next month's supply chain webinar. Awesome. Thank you so much. Bye everyone. Bye.